Good morning. Welcome to KBC. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Kinnell Bay Church. Hello, and welcome to Kinnell Bay Church. Welcome. everyone and a very warm welcome to Kimmel Bay's digital church service. It's our sincere hope that you will be blessed by joining us today as we continue on with our series, What is Church? Now if you remember from last week, Hugh shared a description of the church as the body of Christ, diverse yet united. And that made me think of the Latin phrase, e pluribus unum, from many, one. A community of many different people, all coming together as one, so that they may serve and care for each other by sharing the love that they have received from God. Now I ask you, are you caring? Are you serving? Are you sharing God's love with those around you? If not, there's no better time than the present. I understand that many of us are struggling. Many of us have are fighting health issues or caring for those that are ill at this moment in time. Many of us are struggling to make ends meet and wondering what the future holds. Many of us are having a very difficult time coming to terms with the different changes in our routines and the structure of our daily lives. Now, whatever it is that is burdening you at the moment, I say just come today and lay that burden down. Focus your hearts and your minds on Jesus, the living stone, the perfecter of your faith. Now today, Lisa and the worship team are going to be guiding us into a deeper knowledge of God's presence through song. And that will be followed by a wonderful testimony of God's saving grace. Joe and Sarah have prepared a sketch for the children and youth that will help teach them some important truths about God's church. And Joe will be bringing us today's reading from the book of John, chapter 17. We have a few church members who have kindly agreed to share what church means to them. And Darren will be faithfully opening up God's word to us in his sermon today. It's my hope that God will open up your heart and your mind to what he wants to share with you today. And may you diligently listen and receive the blessing of seeking God together in this way. Enjoy the service.
Friday night, we were in Jackie Marshall's bedroom, she lived on a council estate in Salford, and nine of us were crammed in this little box room. We're smoking cannabis and listening to Bob Marley and the Whalers. The windows are vibrating with the bass line. We've got money in our pockets. And we're getting ready to go to Manchester, as we did every weekend, clubbing. And one of the lads came in, Huey, says, hey, guys, I've got some heroin who wants some. And we all went quiet. And I remember the glimmer of curiosity in Craig's brown eyes. He was always the first to jump in. He said, I'm up for it. Huey said, I'm game. And everybody in the room had their heroin. And I was the last one out of all of us. They're going, come on, Woody, it's your turn. And I remember thinking, I don't want to be the odd one out. I don't want to be the only one not to take the heroin because I want to know what it feels like. And I must say that was, I said, yes, of course. So you succumbed to peer pressure. I did, absolutely. I'm not blaming my friends. No, no. Because I'm responsible for my own choices. Of but course. the pressure of my friends, because they'd all done it and the excitement of it all. And, oh, well, I don't, I don't really want to be the only one not to. And that was the worst choice I ever made in my life because then it was all downhill from there. Yeah. I became an addict, but I was once an addict. Absolutely. So tell us about the days that followed and um, how bad did it get? And Well, I met a woman who was 11 years older than me and she was going out with a drug dealer who was well known in Moss Side. And I started to go out with this girl behind this drug dealer's back for, for quite a few months really. And then it, everything changed and the drug, drug dealer found out. And we moved into a block of flats that are still there today in my side called Meredith Court. And now I'm living in my side. I'm with this woman who's 11 years old, older than me. She's got a lot of contacts. And, and by this point, I'd started to, to sell cannabis, very small time, and, and, and sell a little bit of amphetamines at weekends and LSD. But when I moved into that flat, now I had a flat, a base, where people could come to buy drugs from. So they could come to my house or my flat any time of day, any time of night. So I started to make decent money. And it was when I was living in Meredith Court when I started to sell heroin. So it all started that Friday night in Jackie Marshall's bedroom. Yes. And now I'm in my side in a flat selling heroin. And obviously my, my habit grew and I, I started to commit different crimes to pay uh, for the money that I needed to, to, to source the drugs that I was addicted to. And that was my life for years. I ended up in prison, John. I, I, I went in prison. I was under 21 the first time and I got put on the hospital wing because I was a heroin addict. In those days, they gave you no treatment. They just put you on the hospital wing for a time. And then I, I came out of the hospital wing and they put me on uh, the young offenders wing. I was on there for quite a few months. And then I, I eventually got out and I just went straight back to my side, back to the drugs, back to the crime, back to the madness. Straight away? Straight away, straight away. All, in fact, the first day I got out of prison on that occasion, I had heroin. And, and that, was, that was the story of my life for, for quite a long time. So even though you were like in prison for a while, you still made the decision to take heroin the day you got out. Yeah, I, I, I got drugs smuggled into prison while I was in prison. But then obviously you encountered the truth. I did. Jesus Christ mm. and Jesus Christ set you free. He did. Tell us a little bit. How did that happen? Well, I came out from one sentence, John. Uh, I, I'd, and I was, another sen I'd been, I'd done a sentence this time, I'd been impressed in prison. And again, first day that I got out, I went and scored heroin and, and I bought loads of amphetamines, which gives you energy. And I just wanted to celebrate getting out of prison. And I wouldn't let myself sleep. I just, instead of sleeping, I'd just take more amphetamines, more amphetamines, more amphetamines. And nine months later, after getting out of prison, I, I, I was still awake, I hadn't slept. And, and God knows that's true. The mind has, has got a, a tremendous capacity to handle a certain amount of abuse, and the body has. So I'd been awake for nine months. I was skinny as a rake, and then right out of the blue, I started to hear voices. And I thought all the people that I knew who lived in the flats where I lived, on the ball rings in Moss Side, in Newman Moss Side, were shouting out the windows at me. And I, I was convinced that they were real. And I lived with those voices for nine years. Amphetamine psychosis, the diagnosis was. I'd been in a mental hospital for a few months as well. And then I'd split up with my girlfriend, Lisa, and I moved to the outskirts of Greater Manchester into this little flat down a cul de sac. I'd lived in yes. hostels. I spent a year in one hostel. I've lived in host literally lived in hostels. They've been my home. But then I moved into this little flat. And Thursdays were the best day of the week for me because I cashed my benefits on a Thursday. 
So I went into the post office this Thursday, cashed my benefits, got my money, put my money in my pocket, gets on this bus to go into the town centre. The bus takes off, it stops at the next stop, and this guy gets on. He's got a bottle dot tattooed on his face, he's got a big fat neck and short stumpy fingers. And there was only two seats spare, one next to me and one on the other side of the bus. And this guy gets on, I'm thinking, oh, I hope he don't sit next to me. I wasn't in the mood for a conversation. Sure. You know? But he walks past that seat and he sits on the seat next to me and thinking, oh no. He said, you're all right, mate. How are you doing? I'm thinking, I was doing all right till you sat down. Yes. He said, my name's John. So we got chatting and he was really friendly. I remember getting off the bus thinking that guy was all right. He had something that was different. Yeah. So that was the Thursday. The following Sunday, I was taking my dog for a walk. I had a little Jack Russell called Kim. She had a black patch on one eye, short, stumpy tail. She was really <laughs> aggressive. I'd got her from yeah. the, the dog's home in Manchester. And as I was walking past the hospital to get her to this field that I took her to every day, I bumped into this guy again. I said, mate, remember me? I was talking to you on the bus on Thursday. He said, of course I remember you. I says, where have you been? He said, church. I thought, oh no, he's a Bible basher. Yeah. He says, you can come if you want. We meet every Sunday in the hospital grounds. I said, mate, church ain't my thing. He said, okay, he went his way. I went mine the next day and taking my dog for a walk past the hospital. And now I'm looking for a church as I'm walking past, but I couldn't see a church building. He must have been having me on. No church in there. Wednesday was my first appointment with my new psychiatrist in this new area. Since moving from central Manchester to the outskirts, this was my first appointment with, the, with my new psychiatrist. His name was Dr. Samuel Yangi. He was from Nigeria. I thought nothing of that appointment. It was just normal for me to be having appointments with doctors and psychiatrists. That afternoon, taking my dog for a walk, looking for a church. No way could I see a church. Friday morning, 10 past nine. Knock on my front door. Who's that? Is that the police? Natural reaction. Of course. <laughs> yes. Still today, I went to the front door, opened the door. It was this little woman. She said, hi, I'm your next door but one neighbour. I've come to introduce myself. My name's Dot. She said, you just moved in, haven't you? I said, yeah, a few weeks ago. Your dad drives red cow, doesn't he? I said, yeah. He said, she said, you've not got much furniture, have you? I said, no. She said, I've just got a brand new fridge freezer. If you want my old one, you can have it for free. So I took her fridge freezer, even though I had one and sold it to my brother for 20 quid. Yes. Yeah. And then just before she left my doorstep, I said, Dot, she told me your name. Can you help me out? I said, the other day I met this guy when I was taking my dog for a walk past the hospital grounds and he told me they went to church in the hospital grounds and this week I've been looking for it and I can't see it. Do you know where it is? She says, oh yeah. I go to that church. <laughs> I'll take you on Sunday if you want. I'm thinking, yeah. oh no, I didn't want that. I'll come for you. So Sunday she comes, knocks on the door, walk up Birchall Road into the hospital grounds and she takes me into a, a prefab. It wasn't a church building. It was a house church. And they used to meet on a Sunday in this community type centre place in, in, the, in the hospital grounds. I walks in, sits on the second row from the front, Dot sits to the end, I sits next to her. Then there was a tap on my shoulder I look round, it was the guy that I met on the bus with the bottle dot, the big fat neck and the short stumpy fingers. He said, mate, I didn't think you were interested in coming. I said, I wasn't. But Dot knocked on my door. This is Dot. He says, you don't need to introduce me to Dot. He says, well done, Dot, for bringing him. Yes. I'm thinking, these two have set me up. They must have planned it. And then I heard the words behind me, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I look round and it was my Nigerian psychiatrist. <laughs> It was an elder in the church. Amazing. You couldn't make it up, could you? Uh, no, not at all. I'm thinking, have these guys been following me? Yeah. Remember, I wasn't well. <laughs> I was suffering from amphetamine psychosis. Yeah. They, they've been following me, but that was, that was it. So then the guy gets up and he says, we believe in a God who can heal. After he spoke, he said that. If you want to be prayed for, for anything, come to the front. I thought, what have I got to lose? So I got out of my seat and I walked to the front. What can I pray you for? I'm thinking, how long have you got? So I told him, I said, I've been a heroin addict 15 years. I'm on 55 mils of methadone. I says, but the main thing I need prayer for is that I hear voices. In fact, my doctor's just sat down there. He says, OK, I'll pray with you. He put his hand on my head. I'm thinking, what's he doing touching me? I thought, I better just roll with it because I'm in his gaff. And he started to pray. And as he started to pray, John, something happened. I was shaking as he was praying. And I remember as he prayed, he kept repeating a phrase after each prayer in the name of Jesus. Yes. And he'd pray again and he'd say that again, in the name of Jesus. And as he prayed and repeated that phrase, I was shaking. I had tears streaming down my cheeks. I had a feeling inside like there was fire being poured inside of me. I'm thinking, wow, get your hand off me head. Wow. And then he said, amen. I'm thinking, what does that mean? 
So I opened my eyes and he'd sat down. I walked back to my seat and something had changed. Completely. Completely. That day I was prayed for in the name of Jesus and I was changed. And I'm with you today, 24 years later, still changed. 24 years clean. So I was once an addict and now I'm clean. So from that moment, you never took another drug? Four weeks after. So I was Four on 55 after. mils of methadone. The next day I took 20 and then I went down five mils a week till I was on zero. I remember walking home, John, walking through the front door of my little flat, yeah. closing the door behind me and standing in the hallway. Silence. You heard no voices. First time in nine years. No voices. See, that's gotta be God. Yeah. Morning, Sarah. Morning, Joe. You okay? I'm fine. I was just reading the newsletter, seeing what we've missed and what's coming up. Oh, God, what's going on this week? On um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, there's Zooms for children and youth. That's a lot of Zooms. That is a lot of Zooms. There's house groups on Tuesday. Uh, there's food bank on the Tuesday and Friday. Prayer group on Thursday. Uh, Bible study on Wednesday. And there's meals being cooked and delivered from here on a Sunday. On a Sunday? On a Sunday. Oh. Well, where is everyone today? I don't know, it's getting a bit late. It is Sunday, isn't it? It's definitely Sunday. Yeah. Sarah? Yeah? There's no one on the sound desk yet. Oh, well, fortunately, aren't they? Yeah, but why is it? Joe, I don't think that's an issue because there's no one here to lead worship. There's no one here to preach. That's not going to work, is it? Um, actually, there's no chairs out. There's no chairs for people to sit on. Yeah, there's no people. I was about to say there's no people. Does that mean change isn't happening today? That's strange. Hey, what did you just read? I said that on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, there's a presumed to children. There's a prayer meeting on Thursday, there's Bible school on Wednesday, there's house groups this week, we've got meals on Sunday. That's it? What's it? Don't you see? The newsletter, yeah. Sarah, the newsletter is telling us what's happening this week. Yeah. That is church. All the Zoom groups that we have during the week. Okay. That's part of church. All the food bank serving the community, the meals on Sundays, the Bible studies, the house group, all of these things are church. So even though we're not in the building, church is still happening. That's right. Church doesn't need to be in the building. The church are the people, and wherever the people are, whatever the people are doing, that is church. That does make sense. Oh, 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 oh! And the tissue would have helped me. Mm -hmm. But all the other tissues are still there, and that one's still standing there. Okay. So that's church. Because when we go out to send someone out to help, or when someone from church goes out to help, there are other people still supporting them and still lifting them up and almost ready to go out and help themselves. That's right, and each tissue that comes out of the box, each person that is out of the building doing different things, are actually being church. Ah. And all the others are still holding them up. And tissues can be used for so many things. Okay. If somebody's upset, you can use tissues. You can use it to blow your nose. You can use it to blow your nose. You can use it to clean up a mess. Clean your glasses. Lots of uses. Tissues are very useful. But even more so, people as the church can serve in so many different ways and still be church. We don't need to be in the building. My. I'll tell you what then, Joe. Should we, uh, should we get home then so we can watch the service? That's a good idea. Oh. Ready? Ready, <laughs>
To many, church is a building where Christians to meet to worship God. To me, it's more than that. As the last year has shown, you don't have to meet in a physical place. To me, it's a, a place where Christians can come together, who know God as their saviour, to worship and share fellowship with one another. And not only that, but to come along and care for one another, show love to each other and support one another. Church, church as we've learnt over lockdown, is not the building that we go to on Sunday or the neighbour's house that we visit for home group. Church, church for me is the, the people that get up early to pray with me over the phone before I go to work. Those that light the candle for me and pray for me while I'm there. Those that make scrub bags and send me chocolate through the post. Uh, an encouraging text. The neighbour that makes sure my parents are okay when I can't be at home and that they have everything that they need. The friend that goes for a walk with you, socially distanced, and then FaceTimes you in the evening and prays with you and chats and encourages you. These are the people that are the hands and feet of Jesus in our lives, who are lights for us and help us to shine brightly as well in our walk with Jesus. This is church. Church. What is church? In Greek, eklos. In Greek, ecclesia. So church can look like this, or it can look like this. Or maybe like this, or my preference, this. So church isn't so much a location or a building, it's more who you're with and what you're doing. So it's an assembly of people who come together to worship and to strengthen each other's faith.
Welcome to KBC. I'm in the conservatory. It's freezing cold. The ice has just melted off the glass. Lisa's working from home and Lisa's homeschooling the boys from home. So I've been relegated. Gone are the days when I'm stood in a t-shirt enjoying the nice warm weather. That six months has gone quick, hasn't it? I'm going to take my hat off, but scarves are the new ties. So in our series, what is church? Why are we exploring that question? Well, according to Geffen, church is when six men go up to a mountain hut and they listen to each other snore all night long. But we had a great time of fellowship, a great encouragement, and we met around God's word and had a fire together. But during the pandemic, lots of people have stopped and had time to reflect what is important in life. What's the most important things that we should be doing? And we have an opportunity as church to explore is what is the original design of the church? What's the most important things that we should be doing? Lots of church leaders are saying, is God doing a new thing? I like the term, the old new. What do I mean? 2000 years ago, God birthed the church on the Pentecost when he poured out his spirit in power and fire and it spread like wildfire. That was a new thing, but it was 2000 years ago. The Reformation, sadly, man has drifted and moved away from the original design and God had to bring a reset. And through Martin Luther, he brought the church back to its original design. The Great Awakenings, the Welsh revivals, it's all old news, but then it was a new thing. And we need to be open and listening to what the, the word of God and what the spirit of God is saying to the church and be open in our hearts to see what God's doing in our day. So let's pray before we start. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we come together to meet around your word this morning, we pray that you would help us to be open with our ears. We pray that our hearts would be open to receive what you're saying to us as your church family and help our minds and our bodies be willing to obey you, to walk into the, the new future, the new life, the new journey together. Help us to, to keep you central and to be always listening to what you're saying. In Jesus' name, amen. So, the word church is found 110 times in the New Testament. And the first time it's mentioned is from the lips of Jesus, from the creator and designer of the world. He was the creator and designer of the church. And he says this in Matthew chapter 16 he says i will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it i love that that he says i will build my church it's his church it's nobody else's he's the leader he's the creator and in this verse he is making a declaration that he will build his church it's not the elders church it's not the ministry team leaders church. It's not the members church. It's not any previous pastor or any future pastor. It's his church. And I love the fact that he says he is going to build it. And when he says, I will build my church, it's a promise from God. And I love the fact that when it's a promise of God, I always like to link it to Luke chapter one, verse 37. In my translation, it says, for no word of God will ever fail. When Jesus says, I will build my church, he is going to build it, build it, and he will fulfill that promise and that declaration. In China, just at the communist revolution, they kicked out all the missionaries and they tried to destroy Christianity. And it wasn't until a generation later that Christians got back into China. And there was a fear that the church had been completely wiped out, but it wasn't. It's now a hundred million strong. The underground church is a hundred million strong, if not more by now. God's church wasn't overcome. He continued to build it and it spread. The word church in Greek, the translation is ekklesia. But what does that actually mean? Ekklesia, it means to be called out, to be called out, but to be called out with a purpose to gather together. We're called out to be God's new community, called out from the world to gather together. As God's family, we're adopted 
into God's family. And in Matthew, we see that there's a declaration. In John 17, Jesus' longest prayer, he prays for the church. In the book of Acts, we see the birth and the spread of the church. And then in the letters, we have instructions of how the church should function, how the church should meet together, should worship together, how they should choose leaders, how they should operate in the gifts of the Spirit. But today I want to look at John 17, Jesus' longest prayer. So we're going to go to Joe Welch now, who's going to read those verses for us. John chapter 17, Jesus prays to be glorified. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus prays to his disciples. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that you may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your, your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus prays for all believers. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me, because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. Thank you, Joe. Jesus' longest prayer. And within that prayer, we see some of the characteristics of what a true church should be. I have three points from this prayer. Point one, in the verses, we see glory and glorify mentioned eight times. And verse 10 says this, and glory has come to me through them. Glory has come to me through them. 
One of our primary callings as individuals when we gather together is to glorify God, is to bring him glory. I'm not an, an Anglican, but the Westminster Catechism, it says this and it's quite good. It asks the question, what is the chief end of man? And it responds, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So we're called out to meet together with a purpose and when we gather together, it's to glorify God. When we worship together, it brings glory to God. People say to me, why is the car park in that church always full? What are you doing? We're worshipping and we're giving God the glory. We take our eyes off ourselves. We take our hearts and our minds off each other and we put them fully on him as the head of the church. We give him worship, thanks, praise, and that brings him glory we're called to love one another jesus said this as i have loved you so you must love one another by your love for one another people will know that you are my disciples our love for one another as church family brings him glory and we are called to act and to think like christ jesus we're called to behave like him. Verse 4 says this, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Jesus brought glory to God by completing the tasks that he was given to do. And we bring glory to God by completing the tasks that each of us, us has been called to do. Each of us has been given specific gifts and is called to serve God with those gifts and to serve him with our lives and to complete specific acts of service that have been designed just for you in person. How we serve God, how we live out our Christian lives, how we speak, how we respond to people, how we act to our neighbours, our work colleagues, it all brings glory to God. How we come together, as Hugh said last week, as the body of Christ, in unity but diverse, that brings glory to God. When people see a family coming together, loving one another, that brings God glory. On a Sunday morning before the latest lockdown, we used to go in and we'd see Clarice and Julie peeling potatoes. And then during the service, we'd see Steve and Viv come in and Michelle and maybe some others and they'd go out and they'd deliver food, a Sunday roast that's been prepared for those who are isolating, for those who are on their own, for those that are shielding. Acts of service that nobody sees brings glory to God. Elaine, staying up late hours at night to upload the service to YouTube brings glory to God. People serving in the cafe, people doing finances, People volunteering for food bank and going shopping and all the, all the small acts of service that nobody sees, it brings glory to God. The acts of service by individuals corporately, it becomes a lampstand, it becomes a light to the community that, that these people are doing something, they're acts of love and kindness. We are glorifying the creator of the universe who's transformed us for a purpose. Point two, we're called to be people of the book. Scholars call it a textual community, but we're called to gather together, to study, to apply, to obey the teachings that we find within the Bible. We're called to communicate that truth. We're called to live it out. Verse eight says, for I gave them the words you gave me. Verse 14, I have given them your word. Verse 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus gave his words to the disciples. They wrote it down and we find it in the New Testament. And those, those words, when we study it, when we live it out, when we apply it, when we obey it, it brings transformation to our lives. And then we're called to communicate it, to preach it, to share it. And that brings glory to God. The early church saw this as a priority because it says 
They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. They devoted themselves to learning what the teachings were and to following it and to following Christ. And when we do that, it brings glory to God. I've been part of the KBC family for, for 21 years, part of God's family that meet together in Kimmel Bay. And I've been privileged to come under the preaching and teaching and the leading of four godly pastors, Tony Moore, Trevor Salmon, Gwyn Parry, and Ben Lyons. And I'm thankful for those who have preached and teached faithfully the word of God and the many other retired pastors and ministers as well that have taught God's word. And God's word needs to be central. It needs to be central as a definition of what the church should be. And the preaching and teaching of God's word needs to continue to be central of what we do. When we meet together to worship, to glorify, to study God's word and to hear what God is saying. We're called out to be a people who gather and to study God's word and to live it out. Point number three, verse 18. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. We're called out together to be God's new community, to be God's family, to worship him, to glorify him, to follow him and to study him in his word. But then we're called to go back out. We're not called to just stay in. We're called to go back out to be a people on mission, to be people with a purpose. And sometimes, sadly, if churches stay inward looking, they miss the point of why we were called to be together. And sometimes people become Christians and over the years they lose all their non-Christian friends. They isolate themselves, but that's not what we were intended to be. We're called to be in the world, but not of the world. But we're called to have an influence, to be a shining light. And it's a, it's a challenge to maintain and to build those relationships because I've heard somebody say, you can only speak into somebody's life when you've earned the right, when you've built bridges through relationship, through living your life out with people who don't know Christ yet. So we're called to always be looking outwards. We're called to be a people on mission with a purpose. And we're called to go. In Matthew 28, it says this, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. We're called to advance. We're called to go out and to penetrate the society that we were called out from. And we're called to make disciples. And making disciples is so much more than just inviting somebody to church. It's so much more than just a one time commitment. We're called to walk and to live out the Christian journey with people. We're called to do that through life's journey, to share the, the ups and downs and to, and to guide people, to love people. It's a bit tricky at the moment, walking closer with somebody because of lockdown and isolation. And we can still do that by Zoom and in house groups. And um, one thing I've been doing is going for a run once a week from my house, we go with a friend who's become a Christian in the last year or so, and we run to the top of Rialt Hill there and back as it is 11 miles. And um, we have a time of, of sharing and, and we are, I ask him, how are you getting on? And um, what are you struggling for with? And we, we share the word of God. And then when we're running down the hill, it's a bit easier. We have a prayer time and we just pray for the, the things that we're going through and we enjoy God's creation unless it's snowing or raining in our face, then we just tr struggle on and, and get home. But it's a time of discipleship. It's a time of sharing and running through the journey of, of life together. I hope you loved the testimony at the beginning of today's service when the guy that spoke to the man, he just met him on the bus and he says, where have you been? He says, oh, I've been to church. You should come. He was bold and courageous with his faith and he just invited somebody and the testimony as you've seen he explores it he becomes a christian himself just by somebody being bold and courageous and jesus said i will make you 
fishers of men. Sometimes I get that wrong and, and I, I think Jesus says, I will make you a fisherman. And I say to Leisha, I've been commanded to go and be a fisherman. But we're called to be fishers of men. We're called to throw our bait out and just to live our lives and to invite people to come, to come to church, to invite people to, to explore the truth of our Christian faith, to explore the fact that Jesus rose from the grave. He is alive today and he's powerful to bring transformation and change into people's lives. And we have such good news to share. It's amazing good news. The gospel is amazing good news. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Anyone who calls on his name can have forgiveness. Anyone can experience and encounter God's love. Anyone can have hope and purpose. Anyone can be set free. So we're called out to glorify God by the way that we live, by our acts of service. We're called to be a people of the book, to communicate the, the, the truths of God's word. But we're called to go. We're called to make a difference. We're called to be shining lights. We're called to invite people to come and to know Jesus for themselves and to make disciples. We're called to be a people of the book and we're called to go and to make disciples. It's a challenge, but God wants us to be a people who are a vibrant community, full of life, full of the spirit of God. When we meet together to glorify him, God makes us into a lampstand to our community, to our friends, to our families and God equips us to serve him and to go and to see his church grow and expand and advance one life at a time. Let's pray before we close and go back to Jennifer. Heavenly Father, thank you that we find the truths of what a church should be in your book. And Lord, open our hearts and our minds to hear what you're saying to the church. Help us to be obedient Help us to be open to a, a fresh inpouring of your Holy Spirit so that we can be equipped with power, with love and with fire. And we can be equipped to go and make disciples, to be bold, to be courageous and to share the truth of who you are so that people will know you, so that people will be set free by your Holy Spirit. Lord, come and teach us and encourage us and thank you that it is your church, that you will build your church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Lord, we look to you as the leader and as the head of the church to fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you can meet with us still while we're sat at homes in lockdown, that you can encourage us, that you can touch our hearts. Lord, help us to love one another as you have loved us. Help us to be considerate to be caring and to hear from you, help our acts of service to bring glory to you and to you alone. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless everybody. Look forward to seeing you all soon when we gather together and worship together and bring glory to him. Amen. Well, I hope that you've been blessed by what you've heard today and that a few pearls of truth have been planted within your heart. A huge thank you goes out to all those that have made this service possible, and that includes everybody behind the scenes, as well as those who diligently pray for us here at KBC, and as well as all those um, that we serve in other countries and communities. May God richly bless you, and may you come to understand, as all God's people should, just how high and how wide and how long and how deep is the love that he has for you. Take care and God bless.
Bye. 